To follow up on the panel that we just heard on curators and education, we now have the students who curated the Contemporary Art South Africa exhibition. And one of the artists, Mikhail Sabotsky, whose work is included in that exhibition. And I just wanted to say that these students have been mentored over the last year and a half by my colleague Kate Ezra, who is the Nolan Curator of Education and Academic Affairs. And Kate heads the gallery's education department, and as such, she handles the big picture of all of the educational work going on here. And she works directly with Yale courses, and each semester, this is something that's really very special about what Kate does here at the gallery, each semester, she curates the study gallery. And so she's marshalling faculty requests from every field imaginable, drawing from every area of the collection. And it's remarkable how semester in and semester out, she creates such a beautiful presentation of those works from such diverse areas of the collection. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Kate now to introduce the panel. I am so excited to be here. I, don't, I hope I don't embarrass myself anymore. Um, and I'm so glad that the students will have an opportunity to um, talk about their work with you. Um, there were so many um, thoughts and ideas that came up, came up in the previous um, panel about curating and student involvement and training the next generation of curators that I'm, I'm sure there will be um, ideas that will, will re resonate, but the, the uh, focus on hands-on learning and the primacy of, of prints, because there are so many prints in the exhibition that the students worked on, um, the idea of really looking um, that Dabney was talking about, um, the idea of pushing boundaries. These students um, thought a lot about boundaries and, and how to push them or blur them or work within them. Um, so our panel will be a case study of one of several exhibitions at the Yale University Art Gallery in recent years that have been collaboratively curated by a group of undergraduate and graduate students. There have been eight of these exhibitions since Pamela Frank's inaugurated the program in 2006, and one more is in the works and will open this fall. Each one of these exhibitions has shown that giving students the responsibility for actually creating an, ex an exhibition that will be viewed by the public deepens the student's learning and at the same time has much to teach those of us who have the pleasure of working with them. The exhibition Contemporary Art South Africa opened yesterday, and I hope many of you had the opportunity to see the exhibition and attend the tours. For this panel, we have six of the students who participated and one of the artists. Last spring, I selected this group of students and charged them with creating an exhibition on contemporary art in South Africa using a small um, group of works that were already in the gallery's collection as a starting point. I had already gotten permission for this student curator team to borrow works from a few other local collections, which is not a common feature of our student curated shows and was a real privilege for us. The rest of the work was up to the students. They had to decide which artists and which works to include, what themes or ideas to focus on, what type of information to include on the labels and in the brochure, and many other aspects of curating an, curating an exhibition. Having spent more than a year on this project, meeting every week over three semesters, the students have deeply engaged with the subject of the exhibition and with the museum itself, and with many of my colleagues here who I thank deeply for all the time that they have spent working with the students. This panel will be an opportunity for the students to reflect on, their, on the process and what they will take away from this experience and bring with them into the next stage of their lives. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce them to you um, from left to right. So on the far left is Christina, uh, Christina Wells, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of African American Studies and Sociology with a certificate in Women's Gender and sexu Sexuality Studies. Her dissertation focuses on Black Atlantic contemporary art collectives and seeks to situate the present moment within a longer history of black artistic production. For the past four years, Christina has worked as a Wordle Gallery teacher, teaching the K-12 classes that visit the gallery. Next to Christina Wells is Christina Vernicole, who will graduate next week with a BA in History of Art. 
She's also a practicing artist and has worked for the past three years as a gallery guide here at the gallery, giving thematic tours to adult visitors. Christina has organized several exhibitions of Yale student artists' work, and this summer she will be working for David's Werner Gallery in New York. Next is Catherine Kalin, who is a junior at Yale and will, will graduate next year with a BA in English. She's a student guide at the Yale Center for British Art and has participated in two student curated exhibitions there across the street in addition to working here on Contemporary Art South Africa. Claire Schwartz just finished her second year as a PhD student in African American Studies and American Studies. Her research concerns the intersections between poetry and contemporary black Atlantic art and I am sure that at least a few of the artists in our exhibition will play a role in her research and writing. As an undergraduate at Williams College, Claire traveled to South Africa to look at innovative conceptions of institutional memory as, is, as exemplified by the District 6 Museum. And after graduation, she spent eight months in Cape Town on a Williams College postgraduate research fellowship. It was a huge boon to this project that four of the seven students had previously studied or done research in South Africa. In the center is Mikhail Subotsky, seated among the students. He is um, the artist whose wonderful film, Moses and Griffiths, is included in the exhibition. I hope many of you had the chance to see the film last night during our evening of conversations and performances. Mikhail received his, his BFA from the uh, Michaelis School of Fine Art at the University of Cape Town in 2004, and he has since achieved international acclaim for his photographs, which combine the directness of social commentary while questioning the, the nature of the photographic medium itself. Mikhail's work can be found in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the South African National Gallery in Cape Town, and the Johannesburg Art Gallery, as well as other museums in Europe and the United States. His photographs have been included in many international exhibitions, and Mikhail has already received numerous awards, including the 2012 Standard Bank Young Artist of the Year Award for Visual Arts, which is the highest honor for a young South African artist. He also received a similar award from the International Center for Photography in New York, and he has been inducted into the prestigi prestigious Magnum Photo Agency. Mikhail is here in New Haven to supervise the installation of Moses and Griffiths in our exhibition, and we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity if he could also participate on the panel not only as an artist who is naturally concerned with how his art is curated and presented in exhibitions, but also because Moses and Griffiths is, is itself so concerned with the presentation of information and knowledge within institutions like museums, which is the underlying premise of this whole conference. Next to Mikhail is Katie Fine, who will graduate from Yale next week with a BA in history, although she has taken many courses in the history of art. For the past three years, Katie has worked as a gallery guide here at the Yale Art Gallery, giving both highlights and, and thematic tours. And she's studied abroad in South Africa during her junior year at the University of Cape Town. And she's looking towards a career in museum and education and will be attending the Harvard School of Education in the fall. Finally, Denise Lim will receive her MA in African Studies next week and will be continuing on at Yale as a PhD student, student in sociology next year. As an Africanist, she is interested in cultural and artistic production in South Africa and how that interacts with historical and contemporary politics. Her research focuses on cultural sociological approaches to Anglophone, African, and South African literature in particular. She spent a semester in South Africa as an undergraduate and returned last summer for her thesis research. Matthew Keeney is the one student who's not able to take part in today's panel, and he is a PhD student in history, also focusing on South Africa. You can see that the diversity of disciplinary backgrounds and approaches that the students brought to the project, and th this diversity was crucial to the development of the exhibition and added so many layers of meaning to the discussions and ultimately made it a much more complex and more subtle exhibition. So I'm gonna take my seat and then we will unpack the curatorial experience for these students. So, thank you again for being a part of this wonderful panel for this wonderful conference. 
So I want to start off by asking you, as a group, you have so many different backgrounds and so many different levels of experience, both with South Africa and with contemporary art. So how did you grapple as a group with the charge that you were given to assemble an exhibition of contemporary art from South Africa? Um, I can try to respond to that first. Um, I think for me, coming from an African studies background, um, especially my entry point was my interest in South Africa and South African cultural production. Um, I was very um, concerned uh, that we would be careful about the way that we're re representing South Africa, first of all, um, to a foreign audience, especially in this particular context. Um, and because I wasn't sure how much sort of text could be provided to um, provide some historical context to um, uh, South Africa's sort of very difficult past. Um, I also was interested in the way that um, art could communicate um, certain information that you couldn't otherwise um, in the textual way. Um, and I also found that even though I wasn't as familiar with visual art, um, a lot of the debates that were going on among South African writers um, were kind of the same questions that were going on among visual artists as well. Um, so questions about identity gets very difficult um, in a country that is quite um, diverse. There's a lot of different kind of social groups that exist, um, whether by linguistic lines or uh, racially stratified lines, um, different ethnic groups that were sort of formed. Um, I, I also was uh, concerned that we wouldn't um, give an impression that South Africa is sort of this, this one thing, um, only plagued by sort of an apartheid history. I think we really wanted to be able to be uh, to touch base with that history, but not also not have the art that we choose be consumed by it. So in the beginning, we were reconciling our different disciplinary backgrounds in the interest of defining these key terms. For Denise, it was so helpful to have um, this uh, substantial background in African literature, and specifically South African literature, we went about defining South Africa. Um, it was also quite a difficult challenge to define contemporary art um, and to define contemporary art from South Africa. And we all wielded different uh, sort of strengths in that, in that process of defining these key terms. And as you'll see in our title and in, in the exhibition, if you go have a chance to visit, um, th that those uh, definitions and that process of grappling with that charge really mm -hmm. informed the end result. Yeah, I think it was immensely helpful that we were um, charged with contemporary South African art and it actually turned out to take pretty much the whole process grappling with what these terms meant. And then sort of the invisible fourth component, I guess, would be um, to think about what the role of the institution is, what the role of the Yale Art Gallery is in presenting these narratives. So it wasn't really... South Africa that we were drawing from. It was actually South African art in the tri-state area. Um, so to kind of, I mean, to kind of really think about, to take seriously what the institutional collecting practices look like and to think not only about presenting South African art from the vantage point of looking at South Africa 20 years after the formal transition to democracy, um, but also looking at ourselves, looking at that, um, yeah. Can you, um say a little bit about how all of this, these discussions and the grappling with these different terms and, and ideas led you to the idea of the slash and what the slash is for people who have not seen the beautiful title wall or the brochure that incorporates it? Sure. Um, so we settled on a title of contemporary art slash South Africa. Um, as I said, it, it is a very much a visual embodiment of the reconciling those, of those two distinct entities. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about the qualities of distinction and categorization, specifically in South African history, um, both on the side of, of racial categorization and the very problematic history that race presents in the context of South Africa, as well as the distinct boundary drawn between the apartheid era and the post-apartheid era era delineated by Nelson Mandela's election in 1994. Um, and those boundaries, we felt, were being called into question by a lot of the artists and the work that they were putting out. Um, and we hoped that in our, in our exhibition, we would retain some of that uh, sense of blurring boundaries and um, sort of uh, troubling categories that are typically understood as distinct um, by placing that at the foreground um, and, and 
further uh, troubling the distinction between a nation and the art it produces. Um, and so in our exhibition, we hope to present individual artists and individual artworks um, in uh, a way that is uh, very compelling to all viewers, and at the same time present a complex portrait of South Africa today through this lens of blurring boundaries and overturning categories. Sure, I'll pipe up now. Um, I also think that this slash enabled us, um, I guess, rewind 30 seconds. One of our concerns in this exhibition was presenting um, South Africa or the contemporary art produced in South Africa in terms of absolutes. Um, and going back to Claire's comment of looking at ourselves, looking at this art, we are a group of seven students, three undergrads, four graduate students. Um, I was the baby of the group, um, both in terms of age and in terms of term in terms of knowing things about the contemporary South African art scene. Um, and I think we, the slash enabled us to present these works of art not in terms of absolutes um, and enabled the, it, the exhibit to produce a conversation rather than us imposing a definitive thesis statement upon it. So did you, did you want to follow yeah, up? Or? I wanted to add that it was important to us um, not to present the exhibition as a survey. Um, the hope is not for viewers to come away feeling like once I've stepped foot in this space, I've learned all there is to know about contemporary South African art. Thank you very much, good night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but rather to enter uh, into a number of worlds, into a number of um, art making practices through a number of different sort of categories that we've put up. And I think that the work with graphics, um, really help to push that idea. And if you'll go up to the exhibition, you'll see that uh, rather than delineating spaces in the exhibition by one section text that represents all of this work, um, we decided instead to include section text that sort of refer to all of the works so that you can mine the collection and mine the exhibition a number of different ways. You can go back uh, a number of times and see the works in conversation with one another based on very different um, vantage points. So that was another kind of solution to uh, some of the challenges that we faced. And in that same vein, the um, exhibition itself, the layout of the work is extremely open. Uh, we tried not to cordon off any particular areas or create specific groups within our works. Going back to this notion of blurring boundaries, um, there's a lot of space for the viewer in terms of eyeline was something that we had many discussions about um, in our curatorial process. I, I want to ask um, Mikhail, um, how do you, as an artist from South Africa, feel about seeing your work contextualized in, in this kind of an exhibition that focuses on contemporary work from South Africa as opposed to being in a, an exhibition of contemporary art generally or an exhibition of the entire African continent or some other subset of contemporary art? What does it mean for you to be in an exhibition like this? Thank you. Um, before I answer that, I do want to congratulate the curators and yourself, Kate. Um, I think it's a very, very coherent and interesting presentation of contemporary South African art and um, one that I'm honored to be a part of, so thank you for that. Um, what you're raising is, is difficult for me as a, as a young-ish South African artist. Young. Um, uh, I, I've been a, a part of a number of kind of survey shows, both of uh, South African art and uh, African art from across the continent, and you always do get the feeling that as interesting as the exhibition might be, you are being put in a little bit of a basket, just um, in the same way as uh, photographic surveys might do in another respect to my work. Um, but I also understand that uh, every exhibition needs lim its limitations, and sometimes nationality or uh, geography is an important um, starting point for that. Um, I think uh, in, um, in South Africa, we have a heavy burden of particular lines of thought um, and uh, uh, kind of themes within our artistic production. And I think uh, the important thing is to, is to, as an artist, from an artist perspective, is that one doesn't get weighed down by, by how heavy those, those things are historically, um, themes of identity, themes of politics and demonstration. 
and and so yeah, I, I appreciate the fact that this exhibition has not um, uh, uh, gone in in predictable ways down those lines. Great, thank you. As student curators, um, for many of us, it was our first curating experience, and we came to this idea of blurring boundaries before we knew how it would manifest in the final uh, exhibition stage. And so to make all of this real, we relied on a lot of expertise in the rest of the gallery's community and in the, obviously with Kate's mentorship, but also from different departments. And I think that was maybe one of the most um, exciting aspects of being a student curator um, it was the, the combination of bringing um, insightful and new and fresh and kind of uh, perhaps uncuratorly ideas, um, and seeing those manifest with gallery expertise in the interests of um, putting together this exhibition that um, we're very proud of. So I know we're all so pleased with the way the exhibition looks now and the way it's, it's turned out, but I know from having been part of the weekly meetings that there were several challenges and pressure points. So um, differences of opinion and lots of discussion. So I'm wondering, what did you find most challenging about this project? What were some of those issues that you needed to discuss and overcome and resolve? So I think to begin with, the tech, coming from a technical standpoint, uh, one of the most challenging uh, dimensions of this process for me was not being able to see the work in person, per se. We did actually borrow um, a great deal from outside of the institution. I think one of the most helpful um, points in retrospect was being able to see the core works of the, of the actual Yale Art Gallery collection um, in person and to be able to have engaged discussions about these works and then sort of expand on that framework that was already in place for us. Um, for me, coming from an artist background, uh, process is very important for me and always my entry point to a work of art. Um, so really, one of the most, I mean, this probably goes without saying, but it was incredibly rewarding to be up uh, in the gallery during the installation process and actually see these things brought out of their packaging um, and finally get a sense of what it means to actually paint with ash, uh, which is one of the works that we have from Diane Victor called Ash Man Johnny. Um, and you know, it's all incredibly cool to talk about in theory, but then when you actually see it in person, you understand what kind, how our ideas that our exhibition is shaped around is actually conveyed in, in that process and in that specific work of art. I think one of the really, I think one of the really amazing things about this opportunity was kind of going into a blind in a way. I mean, I had really approached the museum as a museum goer up until this point, so I didn't really think about a lot of the um, kind of logistical issues that you run up against. As I mentioned, we were fortunate enough to be able to borrow, but our borrowing was constricted in a certain way. Um, and so I think, as Mikhail was saying, there are um, limitations to any coherent exhibition. Um, but something that was really challenging for me was to make those limitations and their stakes known. Um, so, I mean, one thing just really concretely that came up is we have a lot of William Kintridge's work in the exhibition. Um, so to think about what really Kintridge has meant um, and what it means that we have so much Kintridge work um, and maybe other artists are less represented because of that, um, those have raised really generative challenges about collecting practices and the moment that we're at now. I think another exceptional set of circumstances that we were delightfully dealt with was the fact that at the end of the day we were, were we seven or were we eight? There were seven. Seven and student curators, um, four graduate students, three undergrads, all entering from different um, points of interest, starting with different knowledge bases. Um, so I think one of the other big, not so technical difficulties that we had to um, overcome was we all had to get ourselves to a uniform baseline level of knowledge to a certain extent, um, which was a really excited process. We had bibliographies, felt a little bit like a class for the first three months. Um, and then once we were able to get to that point, we were able to have the conversations that led us to the exhibition as it is now. Mikhail, you were about to say something. Yeah, I want to jump in here and kind of answer a question that hasn't been asked of me, but um, Claire mentioning um, <laughs> <laughs> William Kentridge, um, 
made it urgent. Um, so so it's, it's been very interesting for me to um, sit in on, I haven't managed to catch all the conference sessions, but particularly this afternoon I was sitting in and listening, and I got such a sense of, um, or maybe I brought with me a sense of perspective, and, um, uh, and I'd like to kind of try and describe this to you with regards to um, continuity and discontinuity. Um, for me, the very idea of having such an amazing art museum on a campus and have defining it um, at least partially in terms of being a teaching institution is this incredible vision of continuity. And it's a continuity that comes from an incredible luxury of resources. And I know it might not be fashionable to talk about a luxury of resources in America in the economic climate right now, but it, it really does strike me. And I think it's something that's really, really important to think about, both in a positive and then perhaps also in a challenging way. And I'll get in a moment how this relates to the things being discussed. Um, but um, spending my whole life in South Africa, being born and growing up in South Africa, we have a very strange kind of combination of resources and lack of resources. I was very lucky to get a very good university education um, and, and through my career to have access to a lot of resources. Um, but there's this unbelievable discontinuity between, for instance, the university and the commercial art galleries and then the kind of gaping hole of the public institutions which don't perform the function that they should uh, perform in creating continuity between those different organizations. So the fact that you guys are all here having this conversation about how to kind of um, link different disciplines, link different departments, link the schools and the, un and, and the museums, um, it, it, it is really amazing and inspiring. And part of me wants to say, um, can, you, can you share some of that with us? Um, <laughs> But another part of me thought about it a little bit deeper and thought about what the challenge of discontinuity brings to artists and curators and scholars in South Africa. Um, and um, I, I, I guess I'm bringing this into the conversation because I, I think that there's something that can be very strong that can be learned from there. What are strategies um, by artists, by curators to make up for the lack of continuity between institutions? Um, and if I have a criticism of, of this process is that um, perhaps um, you guys haven't learned enough about those survival strategies because I think those come in very much into, into artistic practice in South Africa. For instance, one of our better known curators now, um, Gabi Ngobo, is part of an organization called the, Hist uh, the Center for Historical Reenactments, which is you know, a collective put together by artists and curators. Um, and um, so, um, for us, that, that, that is educational. You know, that, th those are institutions which we're being forced to make. And while I think the, the, um, the incredible resources that everybody here has within their institutions is something that should never be wished away, I think there's a lot that you can learn from us in kind of in finding new strategies for the new ages of, 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 of what our survival strategies are. Um, and um, yeah, I came to all of that really through, through, through Kentridge, who is, is really a great hero of mine, a great inspiration to a lot of South Africans. Um, but it is also you know, a reflection on resources that Kentridge is, is the starting point of this exhibition. It's you know, greatly, um, uh, he, he, the respect for him and his work is, is, is absolutely earned and, and amazing. But um, it, is, it, uh, yeah, it is a question of resources, and I think that should be thought about. I was just going to say that um, that raises a really interesting issue because we actually um, debated a lot about um, historically and even now sort of the access of opportunities for different artists um, of very different backgrounds. Um, so even though in one sense in the United States, um, Kentridge is sort of heard about but not necessarily to the extent that we might have thought he is. Um, uh, and of course we recognize the, the quality of his work as an artist. Um, but again, trying to grapple uh, with sort of the racial politics or identity politics that goes on, I think, especially when you're talking about South African art. Um, and I think what was interesting for us was that we had this opportunity to um, incorporate art from a lot of different media. Um, and so we had one gallerist who suggested, why don't you look into video art? 
um, because this allows for South African artists who are in the country but haven't been exhibited outside um, to have this opportunity to be exhibited here. Um, and uh, that to me, I, I had never really considered that before. Um, I ha was also not very uh, familiar with video art before um, coming to this project, but I felt like this was a very interesting way to at least alert the public to very interesting artists that aren't um, normally circulated, at least in the United States. Um, and so on, on one hand, you had our limitations of only being able to borrow from the tri-state area. So these are sort of South African artists that are somewhat well known enough to make it over here. Um, but then having to balance that again with ones that are maybe not as well known here, but wanting to give that opportunity to them. So um, yeah, I think those are very interesting points that you raised because I think we, we as a group tried our, our best to at least think about that within the limitations that we had. I think another challenge that we faced is um, the university setting in and of itself and us being so intimately connected to it as a PhD student, as someone who's sort of inundated with discourse and a certain way of thinking and writing, having to translate that to, uh, in, in my writing, in the way that I approach curators and discuss the works and the ideas behind it, um, all of this critical thinking had to be filtered in a way um, to, to continue that accessibility, to continue making the ideas that we are thinking about accessible to a number of audiences. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. Uh, as Tiffany Sprague uh, sort of alluded to in her question for the last panel, how to help students become better writers, but also how to help sort of lofty thinkers bring their ideas home um, in a very clear and effective way. And so that was a challenge, but also a fantastic opportunity as someone who's also looking to continue in museum education. That's something that is gonna absolutely carry me through. And I also wanted to add that our disparate sort of backgrounds and interests I think will also help the curatorial world to expand its pipeline from just the history of art to include folks like us who may not have PhDs in that discipline, but who are getting firsthand experience. So I think the university setting has provided a huge challenge, but also a great opportunity for all of us. That's great. I think. Um I know the label writing was a challenge during the <laughs> process and there were many iterations and every curator, no matter whether they're a student or they've been working for 25 years in the field, goes through all those drafts and I have to say you all nailed it, so mm -hmm. good job. Um, well, now that you can see the exhibition up on the walls and that if you've been in the galleries as you have been, you've seen people reading your, your, your wall text, you've seen people um, looking at the brochure and watching the videos and, and looking at the, at, the, at the works of art, what is it that you as curators hope that people are going to really take away from the exhibition? What's, what's your ultimate goal? Or is there another question you'd rather answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, on one level, I certainly hope that visitors remember individual works of art. Um, we spent so much time with these works of art over the course of the last year and a bit um, in reproduction and in person, um, that we came to know them so well that it's, so, it's somewhat hard for me to imagine what a visitor who's seen the exhibition today must be experiencing, because for most of these visitors, this art and these artists are, are largely unknown. Um, and now that we've come to know them, I can say firsthand that they are incredibly compelling works of art that are applicable not only to the context of South Africa, but absolutely in this context and in all contexts. Um, so I think the first thing is, is meaningful experiences with the individual works of art. Um, and after that, uh, hopefully, the, uh, uh, this, the question of what it means to be an artist in contemporary South Africa um, is illuminating not only for uh, South African cultural production, but also broader on the, on the contemporary global scale um, of, of issues that are relevant in, in contemporary life and um, specific broadly. Yeah, and I hope that people are pleasantly surprised by what they learn. Um, again, sometimes I think when, when people think of African art, they might think of um, sort of stereotypical images. And for us, it's, it's a really special opportunity to be able to focus on a specific African country 
um, and also link that to the contemporary art world. Um, that to me is a very sort of special combination, um, which is why I think we tried to take care not to do it badly. Um, we really wanted to make sure that if, if we're going to frame things in a national framework, which can be problematic in itself, at least let's raise some questions. So I think we really had to, to force ourselves to really think through in a deep, deep way, what is our theme? Because we are really struggling with finding one because we don't want to put this whole thing in a box. Um, so even coming up with the three sub-themes that we had, um, art and politics, personal and social, here and there, um, we kept debating, well, should we create sections that are along these lines? Um, but I'm really happy with how, how we ended up with um, wanting our visitors to think about all of these different themes um, and pairs or how they are boundaries or, or they can cross over, um, how each work can really embody a lot of different themes simultaneously. Um, so I think we were, we were asking our visitors to do a little bit of the work, you know, um, we tried our best within the details of the way that we um, placed all the objects, um, the, what, the places that we chose to put the text, um, even arrangement um, and how we group certain works. I mean, I think we, we tried our best to sort of guide um, that kind of engagement or thought on the, on the part of the visitors. I think one thing that I hope, as Christina mentioned, this is not a survey, and I would hope that people who are coming at least with an eye toward um, creating exhibitions would really think about the way that our exhibit and others before it have put pressure on the idea of a survey, that something can be comprehensive or representative um, in itself, and that's really something that we took from the art itself, which is making use of these categories because, as we've acknowledged, they're important for legibility, but also being really self-conscious about the production of boundaries and the stakes of those production. And, Mikhail, I have one, one <coughs> question for you, and then I'd like to open it up for the um, conference attendees to ask questions. So when we first contacted you, um, and I explained that it was a student curated exhibition. What was your reaction? Did it matter? Did it, was it, um, and was it, did it make the project more interesting or less interesting? Or how as an artist do you feel about being involved in a project that is so based in bringing students into the process? It was a Yale student curated exhibition. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, um, <laughs> I am, um, uh, uh, there's a very personal response is that um, I, I kind of, um, I kind of wish I was a student still. Um, I, uh, I did an undergrad uh, major in, in fine art at UCT and um, have been uh, deprived of the opportunity of doing an MFA by being very busy. Um, and a, a huge part of me um, still wants to do one. And um, we have a school of art right down the street. <laughs> Can you introduce me? Um, so, uh, uh, but but the spirit of being um, in an educational institution is is I think a great privilege and one that I kind of I, I'm constantly feeling like I want to be a part of. And whether it's you know I teach kind of part time in South Africa really for my for myself because I really enjoy it and learn so much. Um, uh, so um, that really wasn't a thought of mine, you know, whether it was curated by students or people from dis different disciplines. Um, it sounded like an interesting presentation and I wanted to engage with it. And we're so glad that you did. So now I'd like to see if anyone in the audience has questions. I see many hands and the microphones are rushing. Uh, hi, thank you. That's such a great project. I was wondering, I'm very interested in what we've been talking about today, sort of teaching curators, teaching the next generation of curators, and as a teacher, I'm interested in the ways that you as students change our practice, um, and uh, so I'm curious if you could comment a little bit more on how this is, how a student curated show is different from a show that's curated by an institutional curator uh, and what that can teach us and what that also tells us about teaching curators. 
Well, maybe I should answer that. Or Christina, you you look like you're about to answer that. I mean, you can definitely respond. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say that uh, one thing that really shocked me with this process was um, the vast amount of nuts and bolts that goes into being a curator. Um, and I think as students, this has sort of been commented on in previous panels, the generation that we're from, we're constantly trying to speed up that process. Um, and so I think in ways, Kate was um, excellent in making us slow down and really think very carefully through each step of the process. Um, but in other ways, it was quite advantageous, uh, the position we were coming from. Uh, one sort of basic example of that would be the fact that when we were playing with which works we would like to select, we created a Flickr account. I don't know if that's something that curators would normally do in an institution, um, <laughs> as it was quite public. <laughs> and we used the groups within that um, technological platform, web-based platform, um, to play with our own personal selections and then merging those selections on a large screen. Um, it was a great way to start with, you know, I don't know how many works we started with, a hundred, many more. Many more. Um, and bring it down to the to what you see in the gallery space right now. But. That's a perfect example of how the students approach the project differently than I think a, a curator would. And I think just the fact that there's seven, there were seven of you, and you all came from such different starting points and different vantage points, that it's uh, that added a, an, a huge layer of complexity to the project that a single curator working alone with their own ideas um, uh, does, not, does not grapple with. And I think it, it really made your work in a way harder, but it also made it much richer that you, that you worked as a team. I'm and Michael. A, I'm Michael Taylor, I'm the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College. And uh, I was so impressed by the exhibition because it really looked like an exhibition. It didn't look like a student exhibition. It had real graphics. It was presented beautifully and selected very well. And you're right, it wasn't a survey. Um, my question has to do with, so you mentioned the nuts and bolts of exhibitions. And it seems like the focus for you was selection and also label writing. And I'm wondering, were there other aspects of the exhibition that you were also involved with? I'm wondering if you were involved with the press release with the marketing campaign, and could you speak about that side of it? And the installation. <laughs> so, uh, Denise the programming. and I... <laughs> <laughs> yes to all of those things. Um, Denise and I wrote the press release. We worked, of course, with uh, members of the gallery staff, but yes, we did that. Absolutely with the installation. We were up in the galleries in all the free time we had. It was coincided, unfortunately, with finals period. Um, but we worked as best we could to have student curators present, at least some of us, in as much as we could. Um, worked directly with the art handlers. Worked when we heard from, the, from MoMA that we could not put the works in, in a space that had too much sunlight. We were absolutely involved in relocating that to a different wall. Um, all, of those, all of those challenges we faced and, and all of those uh, uh, opportunities we embraced. Um, unfortunate rhyme. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of programming, I'll turn it over to uh, perhaps either Claire or Christina, who were very involved in, in that aspect of the project. Um, yeah, we also were involved in programming, and that's actually something that we're trying to work out now. But again, um, it really came out of the conversations that we've had, and I think we foregrounded the selection process because we were charged with working around this particular body of works. And so much of the theme, the way that we were inspired to arrange the exhibition came out of really the work. Um, so in terms of programming, we've invited um, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, because we haven't had confirmations. <laughs> uh, we're in the process. But um, we're hoping to invite curators, artists, um, and also to involve visual arts, as, and um, I mean, sorry, also to evolve, involve um, literary arts as well, and kind of expand the conversation. Can't get too much into specifics. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to. Oh, my name is Amelia Kale. I'm from the Hood. I'm in the back, Kate. Um, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your exhibition, and I noticed that uh, 
in a few instances you have the same artist with multiple examples of that artist's work. And you've chosen not to hang those together, which uh, struck me as very intentional and perhaps slightly unusual. And I wondered if you could talk about that decision-making process, why to include multiple works and why not put them together. Anyone want to explain the, why the four Kentridges are mostly not together and <laughs> Gary Schneider's work is not together, but Cedric Nunn's work is all grouped together? And sure. Um, so in some instances, it was purely logistics. Um, for example, the Kentridge anamorphic projection um, required a very specific space, and we had to accommodate that. Um, but once we were kind of given those logistic challenges and, um, and realized what that would mean for our exhibition, we, we really did embrace that. Um, and we chose to, to intermingle as much as possible the individual artists. Um, in some cases, some artists have uh, works that are either from a series or are closely related. In those cases, they are shown together because we treated them as um, consistent within one theme. Um, but on the more broadly speaking, um, we hoped to uh, increase the sort of connections that were drawn between artists and be between different media and between different artworks, um, including art from different decades even, um, so that the, the theme of, of boundaries and crossings and typically understood distinctions would be further overturned and that new conversations would be inspired. John? Hi. Um. Uh, John Stomberg from Mount Holyoke College Art Museum. Um, first of all, I think you guys knocked it out of the park. Uh, really, it's a great show. Um, and my question is, I'm very interested in group curating and the dynamics of group curating. Um, I'm a big proponent. But I was wondering, now that you have all tried it, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Would you do it again? Or are you looking, hopefully, to curate your next show by yourself? <laughs> Well, Chris, I, I, I would absolutely uh, do this again and again and again if I had the opportunity. Um, working with, with my fellow curators was such a pleasure and such a privilege. Um, it's absolutely changed the direction of my career, I hope, um, my dissertation, my life here on campus. Um, and I know that it's not typically done in the curatorial world for a number of reasons, many of which we've, you know, discuss today the challenges of group work, having to come to consensus, dealing with different uh, levels of um, knowledge and interest and uh, positions in politics even. Um, but I think that it's an invaluable experience. And I'm not sure if you're looking for like the, the dirty details <laughs> um, of, the, of the arguments that we had, but even those were so generative. I feel just Personally, on a really concrete level, it forced me to clarify my own positions really productively. I mean, I think at the later stages are often when you're faced with having to explain yourself, but just coming once or twice a week for three semesters and having to really justify and advocate for what you believe is crucial and really ultimately served the exhibition. Yeah, I never want to curate an exhibit by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Linda. Thank you all very much. Oh. For your great cont contribution. Um, so you have two descriptors of the exhibition. It's South African and it's contemporary. But I'm wondering uh, if um, and if so, what the role of race played in terms of your object selection. <laughs> Sorry, that's always the hardest question for me. Um, I, yeah, I think we, we were quite conscious to try to be as diverse in our selection as possible. I mean, on one hand, we wanted to first select based upon the, the work itself and what attracted us most. Um, and that was actually, for me, something that I felt was a very valuable learning experience because I didn't come from sort of this art history side or even the fine arts side. Um, so actually, I feel like what I've learned the most is just to fall in love with art. Um, but then, yes, of course, because of my particular background, um, very concerned about issues of, you know, colonial gaze or the politics of representation. And so um, 
th that definitely came into play after we had like a certain set of works that we really loved. Um, and then thinking about the stories behind each of these artists, because I think um, we've come to know these works almost like people. Um, I think even for us seeing our own show now and seeing it all up after the decisions and the fights we had, um, advocating for certain ones to be in, or um, in the end, I think uh, we really feel that we know these works. Um, we, we really appreciate the artists themselves. We appreciate their process. Um, the final product. Um, it helps if you know something about sort of the South African context, but it's not necessary for you to really appreciate what's there before you. Um, so I think it really it really operates on a, a lot of different levels. I wouldn't say race was like kind of the, the sole thing that made us pick a certain artist. It's certainly part of it, um, and we have to be sensitive to that. But at the same time, we have to balance that, uh, yeah, balance sort of the appreciation for art itself. I think also for me, as someone who teaches from the collections as a gallery teacher and has done so for the last four years, that's a really important question that we should ask of all the work that's in any museum. It's not a question that should be you know, central just to South Africa or central just to contemporary art, but when we're in front of a Bierstadt, when we're in front of Rothko, when we're in front of any number of works that we teach from, how do we not impose those questions, but sort of bring out the nuances that those questions would suggest. So that was definitely um, a point that we discussed, but also within a larger context of the museum and the works that other visitors are going to see before and after encountering this exhibition. And how can we be a part of that conversation? How can we continue that conversation and not have it just start and end on the fourth floor? And in terms of just to add one quick thing, um, in terms of uh, the sort of ratios within the show or the artists themselves, we were very much focused on the works specifically and how the works spoke to us um, beyond the racial identity of, of the artists who produced them, although quite often that was a big you know, stake within that work of art. Uh, my name is Yi Chenna, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm really curious about how your group came together and what the process was in terms of how you were selected. Did you apply? And I've heard mention of three semesters, so I'm wondering how that worked out and meeting once a week. I'm just wondering about the format of the process of curating the show. Like, did you get credit? You know, all those kind of details. Thank you. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start off by um, saying that um, when we got the go-ahead to do this show and we knew when the, um, the dates would be, I sent out a call for applications for participation. I sent emails to all the undergrads and grads in History of Art, um, School of Art, African American Studies, African Studies, and I think that was... That was the, those were the departments that I targeted, and, the all, and also to the galleries, gallery guides and gallery teachers. And I got maybe about 15 or 20 responses, and I interviewed and talked with people and um, felt that the seven that I selected really brought a range of perspectives and experiences and um, really showed the interest and commitment to the project. That was um, sometime in the sp early spring of 2013, and we started to meet in spring semester. Um, the students don't get any uh, academic credit for this. It's a completely extracurricular activity for the students. It's really their passion, their love, their, their interest that drives it. Um, we broke for the summer, which we had just built up the momentum of forming the group, and then we broke for the, for the summer break, and then we got back together and um, had to pick up that momentum in fall of 2013. Um, and maybe they can talk about how the group actually came together. How did, I selected you, but you, you formed a group. <laughs> <laughs> We 
have some more group forming to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're um, we're. It's been such a pleasure to work in this group, but it did it did require a lot of um, getting comfortable with one another in a way that we could um, be honest about our our ideas and our preferences and our priorities for the exhibition, and that we could reconcile our different disciplinary backgrounds and and wield those differences in the interest of a very productive uh, and and complete effort. Um, the summer break was was difficult, but um, it was okay because we met and we did site visits in New York and we saw artwork in galleries and museums. And then we corresponded the entire time by, by email and sometimes by phone. I think one of the other challenges that now that we're talking about logistics that came up was actually fitting in meeting times to our very busy course schedules. I mean, because we're seven students, you can imagine we don't all take classes at the same time. Um, so we had to to meet um, to schedule meetings whenever we could find that spare time. Um, so that was an, an additional logistical challenge, uh, but we I think we came beyond it. Yeah, I think we would definitely advocate for you know the the use of digital technology. Certainly, um, I live in New York, and oftentimes it was a Skype meeting. Um, it was via Flickr. There were emails. There were Google Docs, so that we could all sort of collaborate together. So to speak to someone's point earlier about how to leverage those, those media, um, it was absolutely crucial for creating that cohesion when scheduling and FaceTime wasn't always an option. Is there time for one more? Yes, sure. One, la one last question. Hi, I'm Kathleen bickford Burzak from the Block Museum at Northwestern. Um, I want to congratulate you also on a really terrific exhibition. Uh, I'm interested in hearing from the students about what the experience has been like of meeting um, Mikhail and working with him, seeing his process um, in installing a really challenging work of art, um, and how that has sort of been a culmination of this experience and what you, I mean, what a great privilege it was really to have him be able to come and work on this and for you all to meet him. and. Wonder if anybody wants to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, absolutely. It's been a huge privilege, and I think that. Um, I mean, just to his. First of all, it's an immensely complicated piece to install. Um, it's a four channel video projection. So I think just sort of um, seeing the work that goes into something that looks seamless at the end is is quite rewarding in itself. Also, he's just been really generous and um, speaking to us about our whole process. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> and just to expand your question, we've also had the privilege of meeting Robin Rode, who was here earlier in the year, um, and may come up for the exhibition at some point. Um, his work is in the first gallery, the video uh, installation. It's fantastic, and it's in the centerfold of our brochure. Um, we've corresponded with Gary Schneider as well. So there have been a number of artists who we've been able to communicate with, to work with, to really understand their intention behind their work. Um, and also to get a better sense of the landscape of contemporary South African art firsthand. And that's just been invaluable for, for a group that isn't able to travel to South Africa. To and there may be since. more artists in the future, but we are not at liberty to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a wonderful um, point to end with. And, um, gets back to the importance of the work and, and the importance of the artists um, in creating that work, and that's the basis of what we build upon. So I just want to thank the students again for all their work, and thank you. Uh, thank you. And before you all get up, um, Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Thank you all the Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the students for uh, such an interesting panel. I did catch the uh, second half of it uh, up there, and uh, you're doing fantastic work. Uh, before, uh, before you go off uh, across the street for reception, I just wanted to welcome you. I know it's a little late for a welcome, 
This is the life of university president. But, um, and just say two words uh, to you. First of all, I feel so lucky uh, to be in a university with the kinds of art collections that this university has. Across the street in the Center for British Art, here at the Yale University Art Gallery, we feel incredibly privileged. And uh, we feel incredibly privileged, really, because all of this is here for our students. When I was dean of Yale College, which uh, was the case some years ago, I used to uh, welcome students by encouraging them to go to the Center for British Art and the Yale University Art Gallery. And I would say to them, why do you think we have these wonderful collections of art at Yale? And they would say to me things like, well, I guess it's a really nice thing that Yale does for the New Haven community. And I would say, well, you know, be a little more selfish. Think, really think about why a university like Yale would have such wonderful collections of art. And they would say, okay, well, we got it. When our parents visit, it gives our parents, a, and I'd say, try again. And they, and they would say, and finally they would say, well, maybe it's here for us, right? And I'd say, yes, it's here for you. And then we would talk about not just how wonderful it is to walk over to a gallery and see beautiful things, or even to take an art history course, let's say, and learn more about the history of art and then get to actually see what they're studying. All that is great, by the way. But the thing that excites me the most is the way in which we teach through collections in all kinds of subjects that might not immediately be obviously about art. And so uh, when I used to teach the introductory psychology course, uh, one of the things I occasionally would do is give them an assignment, like think about uh, the way in which people in a certain place and a certain time understood what it meant to be insane. Right? It's a psychology course, right? And I would say, go over to the art gallery and see if you can find something that helps you understand that question. I didn't mean the staff. Uh, I meant something hanging on a wall. And, and they would often find something interesting about, you know, about uh, representation of something in medical science or something in psychology or just something that they would project their own uh, psychology onto. But they would, they would come back with some interesting Things. Then I used to, in class, occasionally show them a series of, of uh, Van Gogh self-portraits, and we would do a kind of try to figure out what was going on in Van Gogh's mind uh, at these different uh, uh, stages of his, of his own life. Anyway, the whole point of this is not, uh, is not about psychology, but about the integration of art and a wonderful set of collections in, in teaching. And I, I think, for me, that's what this is all about. Now, as a psychologist, I also have another interest uh, in, in art, and that is what, what my lab has studied for now about 25 years is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is the idea that we have a set of skills that help us function in the world uh, that are only slightly related to our intellectual capacities, uh, but that have to do with understanding our emotions, understanding them, uh, identifying them, uh, in ourselves and other people, managing them in ourselves and other people, and then most importantly, using them to motivate ourselves, to make decisions, to solve problems, to do something creative. And people ask me all the time, well, all right, if those are important skills, how do you, how do you get better? And we would talk a lot about, well, one of the things that adults can do, uh, young adults in college or later, is get involved in the arts as a way of honing their skills of perception, and their skills of inference, and their ability to kind of read things, uh, you know, broadly speaking, their ability to interpret them. And uh, I think most of you know we do that with our medical students uh, here. Uh, but everybody can improve these emotional intelligence skills by looking at great pictures. Um, so, you know, for me, it's not that we have these wonderful collections that are great to offer to the community, but of course I'm delighted that that's the case. Um, it's not that we have these great collections that we can offer to parents of students when they come and visit for Parents Weekend, but I'm delighted that's the case. Uh, it's really that we have these great collections that we can integrate in all kinds of interesting ways. It's almost anything that they're learning anywhere in the curriculum, just takes a little imagination. 
The last thing I'll mention, just to, to say it, I, I think our newest, our latest um, creation in this world is actually out on the West Campus. This is the old Bayer Pharmaceutical uh, plant, uh, R&D facility, that we purchased some years ago, a few years ago. And uh, out on that, in that facility, are, is first of all some browsable storage for parts of the collection, uh, particularly this side of the street, and as well as the Peabody Museum. Uh, but next to that uh, uh, storage facility is something called uh, the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. And what I like about this is it is several kind of, it, 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 broadly speaking, it is several different things all uh, co-located, all literally right next door to each other with this great uh, 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 collection storage right next to it. It's two different chemistry labs working on the preservation working on issues really concerned with the preservation of materials over time, whether it's pigments or plastics or tapestries or what have you. How do these things change in response to the climate and weather and indoor and outdoor? Uh, and then next to them is one of the great art uh, conservators, uh, Ian McClure, uh, work, actually working on paintings. And next to that is, uh, I might not have them in exactly the right order, but nearby is a digitization facility looking at ways of making the collections more accessible to greater array of um, uh, people. And next to that is, is Stefan Simone pulling all of this together, creating educational programs. And uh, although I think his original background is on the chemistry side, very uh, enmeshed on the art side as well, and thinking about some of the policy issues, you know, like uh, who owns the Elgin Marbles, or should Yale have given Machu, the Hiram Bingham Machu Picchu collection back to the Peruvians, or, you know, these are, these are fascinating questions. And so I love the idea that we've got in one place chemists, uh, art conservators, digitizing professionals, sort of with, C with computer science background, uh, um, educators and uh, people thinking a little bit about policy. Um, uh, and uh, so, so from, from science to practice, science, humanities, and arts, all next to each other, it's what universities should be all about. And I love the fact that we can use art as the bridging uh, mechanism between the sciences and humanities. So I, you know, those of you who are older and remember, for example, the essay that C.P. Snow wrote on the two culture problem, uh, sort of arguing and predicting that universities are going to be torn apart uh, by the fact that science and arts don't understand each other. Uh, not only do they understand each other on this campus, they're working together in this example in, on, on very important projects that I think are really not happening on any other university campus but this one. Anyway, I hope you have a lot of time to browse around uh, the art gallery, browse around the Center for British Art, uh, enjoy the great work that Jack and Amy have done and uh, the great curatorial staff and student curatorial staff that we have here at this university. We're so proud of it. I can't imagine any place I'd rather be, uh, especially for these issues, and I'm so glad you're here to share it with us. Thanks very much for being here. So, Peter, I want to thank you very much for coming, and I just want to tell everyone here, one of the great privileges of working at this university is we have had the leaders of this university for as long as I've been here deeply, deeply committed to supporting these teaching museums and what it is we do, and it's Certainly the case with Peter, his wife Marta. You can see he shows up here at the end. I've got to tell you what his day was like. Here, I won't bother <laughs> uh, to, to, to share this with you. His wife Marta was just at our uh, governing board uh, dinner, and there's been a long tradition of the leadership of, the, of this university coming in literally to meet with our board, our curators, our students on a regular basis. And not only that, what you need to know about this guy, he's a member of a bluegrass band. <laughs> <laughs> and the name of the bluegrass band is the Professors of Bluegrass, and their latest CD, which you've got to go out and buy, is <laughs> Pick or Perish. <laughs> and I can tell you, this is the only major university 
president in the world who played in his own band at his inauguration. He plays a <laughs> very good bass. No, thank you. <laughs> So uh, we just feel wonderfully uh, fortunate to be able to convene this incredible uh, conference, Peter. It's 350 uh, colleagues from universities all and colleges all over America and abroad. And uh, there's been a tradition of these gatherings uh, before what we've done, and they're going to continue on. And we've just had this spectacular presentation that goes to the heart of what it is to be a teaching museum with these students who are so very proud of. So thank you for spending thank time you. with us. Thank you. Thank you.